Welcome to session five of the ISJL virtual vacation. My name is Nora Katz. I'm the ISJL's director of heritage and interpretation, and I am serving as your tour guide for the virtual vacation so far. I am so excited about this program, and I'm especially excited that we spent um, our last session and that we'll be spending our next few sessions talking specifically about the history of the civil rights movement and the history of Southern Jews and civil rights. Today's session is one that I've been excited about for a long time. It's a visit to Selma, Alabama. Selma is an incredible place. It's full of complexity and contradiction. And I also think that it is something of a holy site um, in terms of the history of the civil rights movement. Usually when I'm in Selma, I am on a bus with one of our Southern Jewish Heritage Tour groups. So I'm trying to recreate that today in a socially distanced way. So welcome to my car. Um, we're gonna be heading to Selma now and I'm so excited to share it with you. Welcome to Selma, Alabama. I have a lot to share with you. We're going to start our virtual tour with an introduction to Selma and its Jewish history. And then we'll explore the history that Selma is most known for, the history of the civil rights movement and the Selma to Montgomery March of 1965. There is a French settlement in this place as early as 1732, and in 1820, uh, it's incorporated as Selma. About 10 years later in the 1830s, the first Jews start arriving. Um, the first Jews uh, to come to Selma are Sephardic Jews who are coming up the river from Mobile, Alabama. Um, and right around the 1840s, Jews from Germany and Western Europe um, begin to arrive. They tend to work in sort of re retail and banking here in Selma. Um, and in the 1880s, there's another wave of immigrants of Eastern European Jews. And many of them are coming to Selma from the Northeastern United States um, and are tending to work in wholesale and merchandise. Obviously, there are exceptions to all of these rules. Um, Selma is a manufacturing center during the Civil War, um, and there are Jews in Selma who are intimately involved with the Confederacy, as well as Jews who um, might be more sympathetic to the Union cause. For example, Joseph Seligman from Selma um, raised money for the Union while his brothers fought for the Confederacy. And there are a lot of stories like this that we hear um, sort of throughout the history of the Civil War. Behind me is the Harmony Club. Um, it was established in 1909, so just 10 years after uh, Temple Mishkan Israel was built. Um, and the Harmony Club was a Jewish social club. It had a restaurant, a men's lounge, a pool table, poker games. Uh, there's a ballroom on the third floor that is still there. Um, and there were retail businesses on the first floor. And so the building is still standing behind me, you can see, um, and it's owned by uh, an incredible uh, artist um, who's, who's using the space in a lot of creative, cool ways. And you can actually uh, rent out part of the first floor on Airbnb if you'd like to uh, stay in Selma overnight. Many members of Selma's Jewish community are interred here at the Live Oak Cemetery just outside of downtown. I'm on the steps of Temple Mishkan Israel. This congregation was founded in 1870. This building was built in 1899. Its maximum membership was about 104 families or around 375 people in 1940. Um, there was actually also a small Orthodox congregation established here in Selma in the early 20th century, but it disbanded right around 1944. I got the chance to chat with Ronnie Leitz, who is the president of this congregation and one of its caretakers. And he talked to me about the history of the Jewish community here in Selma, um, as well as their current efforts to restore this historic structure and tell the story of Jewish life in Selma. Uh, my name is Ronnie Leitz. I was born and raised in Selma. I'm still here in Selma, uh, part of uh, Temple Mishkan Israel, the congregation. Um, I am president of the congregation because I am the youngest of the four of us here in Selma that are left uh, from a wonderful congregation that we've had in years past. So I'm here to caretake our 120-year-old beautiful historic building uh, to make sure that it uh, continues to uh, function as a place for religious services, for tourism, Selma, Alabama is known for its civil rights history, but what people don't know is about its Jewish history. The Jewish community of Selma dates back to the 1830s. That's within 10 years of the incorporation of the city of Selma. 
Uh, we've had uh, as many as 350 to 450 Jewish people that live here in Selma. We've had three Jewish mayors of Selma, city council members, civic leaders, um, a very rich Jewish community in Selma, Alabama. At one time, 50 to 60% of the retail businesses downtown Selma were Jewish. So where would Selma be without the Jewish community of the past is, is something that we like to talk and tell people about. Our, our Jewish community has um, helped Selma grow since the 1830s. Uh, Congregation Mishkine Israel uh, was established in 1870. So the congregation's 150 years old. Uh, the building's 120 years old. There, there's just a, a, a huge story to talk about of the Jewish community of Selma, Alabama. And that's what we hope to do through this beautiful historic building that we have, uh, which is uh, amazing for a city like Selma, Alabama. It amazes people when they walk in and you hear them say, oh my gosh, because it's beautiful and it's historic and it's not expected uh, in Selma, Alabama. Uh, one of the very first questions I ask touring groups that come through, did you ever know there were Jews in Selma, Alabama and no one can raise their hand because no, they don't know. But we've been here for, like I say, since the 1830s and uh, it's fun to tell the story. It's um, a story that's going to get lost if we don't have a, a, a reason to tell it and the reason to tell it is this beautiful historic building. It's a short story in the sense that, just to put it out front, the, the Selma Jewish community as a whole was not involved much in the civil rights movement of 1965 in Selma. And we've done some studying and we've done some talking and of course there's no one really left uh, that we can dig the deep details in. I was 14 years old when uh, 1965, the Civil Rights Movement in Selma 1965 happened here. Um, you have to understand back from what I said about the, the community, the Jewish community, where they came from, as did my grandparents from Eastern Europe in the mid 1930s, uh, as far as my grandparents. Um, in the, so, so most of the late era, Jews that came here from Eastern Europe uh, came in the, in the early 1900s um, ahead of the Nazi movement. But if you read the history of Jews in Europe, you'll know that they were persecuted not only from the Egyptian days, but certainly in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. I mean, the persecution of Jews is documented for every century almost uh, up until uh, and after the, the Nazi movement. So, uh, and of course, anti-Semitism today uh, is, is, is as strong as, as um, we've seen it in, in, in many, many years. But our, our rabbi at the time was a German immigrant. He did not want to be involved in the civil rights movement. So our religious leader, you know, was, was not active. Um, most of the uh, congregation members, you have to understand, were uh, merchants from downtown, had their businesses downtown. And when you start talking about what happened leading up to 1965 in Selma with the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, killing the four young girls, uh, the attempted bombing of uh, Temple Beth El in Birmingham that didn't happen, but the bombing of a synagogue in Atlanta that did happen, uh, the riots in Arkansas, the killing of the two Jewish activists in Mississippi, all leading up to 1965 here. Uh, we feel that this Jewish community, um, knowing that one and, and leading up to 65, 1965, there was already a boycott of white businesses in Selma, which included quite a bit of this congregation because of their businesses downtown. Um, there was um, rumors of bombing uh, um, that there could be a bombing from, for this temple uh, if this community, Jewish community, involved themselves in 
in, um, in the civil rights movement. That's not to say that we didn't have some segregationists in this congregation. We know for a fact there was one uh, member that stood on the bridge with the uh, sheriff's posse. We also know there were some congregate members that behind the scenes uh, helped and, and um, invited uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, visitors to Selma to, to, to their home and, and fed them. So um, for the most part, this community was quiet because here they were living, and, and I can only speak for my parents and my grandparents. All they did was work, come home, provide for their family, worship, and that's all their interest was, you know, knowing where they came from and what their history was with persecution of Jews. Uh, you know, they were, they were caught between a, a rock and a hard spot. What do we do if we do one side, if we involve ourselves in one side or the other, you know, there could be repercussions. So uh, the Jewish community as a whole um, really wasn't involved in the complete movement. I will say for myself, this is a personal view, my parents talk more about the reflection of what was going to happen to us as Jews in Selma uh, beyond 1965, the next week, the next two weeks, my sister and I going back to school. If things were to have gotten worse than what Bloody Sunday was, and it was terrible, no, no question about that. But when you look at the riots and the, and the, the rioting and the, and the looting that happened uh, prior to 1965 here, then when you worried about um, the reflection on us as Jews, because there were so many Jews coming here from out of state that was going to change the culture of Selma, and that's what my parents, they were worried not about um, outsiders coming to Selma and certainly were not worried uh, the, the Voting Rights Act to my parents was a necessary. It was what needed to happen. But they didn't want it to reflect on the Jewish community because we live, they and my grandparents and, and most of this community at that time knew that they were in a place that we had no anti-Semitism. I, I grew up without uh, worrying about being a Jew in Selma, Alabama. I, I grew up without worried about coming to Friday night services, uh, as most of us did uh, growing up in Selma. So we knew that we were safe here, but we also knew that we were Jewish in a Southern Christian town. Uh, I look back over time and I can see and reflect a little bit about, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the right sentiment. Maybe we should have been involved more as a Jewish community. Uh, I feel guilty in, in some respects that, that perhaps um, I didn't or my parents didn't react maybe um, more, more involving in the right, in, in, in the movement for civil rights. But then again, it's not fair for me to judge them in that respect, you know, Retrospect is always, uh, 2020 is always clearer, but um, I just know that my parents reflected in conversations as home was the fact that they worried, they were more focused about not necessarily the movement itself, but what it was going to do to us as Jews in Selma, Alabama. Well, again, I was 14. Uh, I knew, um, you know, I knew what was going on. Uh, again, just reflecting on the, on the conversation that I could hear with my parents, um, there wasn't so much talk about the social issue in our household. Now, my parents may have talked about it within themselves. They were, again, focused on our family safety, their businesses safety, uh, our, 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 our culture, our Jewish culture. But leading up to the week before the third successful march, which included, you know, Martin Luther King and included Rabbi Heschel, my dad uh, 
took my mother and myself and my sister and drove us down to Brown Chapel, which is the was the center of, of that movement where everything started, where Martin Luther King and, and Rabbi Heschel began the organization of the third successful march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge to Montgomery. And I remember seeing police cars lining this long street in front of Brown Chapel, uh, bumper to bumper. I mean, it looked like uh, it looked like a war zone as far as police cars. It looked, I mean, I'm not talking about the surrounding areas as far as buildings and stuff, but it just looked like an army had moved in. And my father said, we're going home and we're, we're locking down, which I felt some concern and fear when he said that. So that's what we did. But, you know, it was scary, I'm sure, for everybody involved, not knowing the, you know, not knowing the unknown of what was going to happen here, <clears throat> considering the two unsuccessful marches, uh, Bloody Sunday as, as well, that had happened here. But uh, personally, as a 14-year-old, um, you know, I, I can't reflect a whole lot except for um, the Jewish side of it, which is what I remember most about it. and, and at home in the conversations. And then this event where my dad uh, drove us down to see exactly, you know, to, to, to see what was going on. And, and this is what we saw and realized we didn't need to be in the middle of this at that time. Regardless of race, we are all fighting for the same thing for Selma and that is, uh, success and 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 uh, better times and a better life. So based on the conversations that we've been having on the virtual vacation so far, and specifically based on our presentation about Southern Jews and Black civil rights, you can probably imagine that I'm really interested in using the history of these marches to explore the dichotomies in Jewish responses to and involvement in the civil rights movement. So I want to spotlight two specific Jews who are intimately connected to the Selma to Montgomery marches to sort of try to understand sort of where some of this comes from. So the first person is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I'm sure that many of you have heard of. Rabbi Heschel is born in 1907 in Warsaw, Poland. He's descended from a family of rabbis. He attends traditional yeshiva and he's uh, ordained as an Orthodox rabbi. He pursues a doctorate in Berlin, but he's deported back to Poland in 1938. And he escaped to London six weeks before the German invasion. And his mother and three of his sisters died in the Holocaust and he never returned to Germany, Austria or Poland. He arrived in New York in 1940, and he served on the faculty of both Hebrew Union College and the Jewish Theological Seminary. And he's a professor of Jewish, Jewish ethics and mysticism. For him, the teachings of Judaism really were a call for activism. He worked for civil rights. Uh, he worked against the Vietnam War. And he had a close relationship with Dr. King that began in 1963 and continued uh, until Dr. King's death in 1968. He was really active in the civil rights movement. He marched with John Lewis and Dr. King here in Selma in 1965 to continue to conduct business as usual, including the business of religious worship, when segregation is the law of the land or when one's country conducts an unjust war is inexcusable, morally and religiously impossible. For Rabbi Heschel, seeing Dr. King use imagery from Exodus and from the Old Testament was incredible. He was a refugee from Nazi Europe, and so seeing this amazing leader sort of calling upon Jewish teachings in that way was really, really powerful for him. And again, his friendship and his relationship with Dr. King and his relationship to the civil rights movement is something that um, he's, he's really known for today in the Jewish community. So I want to talk to you about a second Jewish person who is connected to the movement here in Selma. His name is Saul Tepper. Um, you may have seen his name uh, on a building in the background a lot of a lot of those really iconic Bloody Sunday photographs. He is a member of Temple Mishkan Israel. He's a World War II veteran and he's an ardent segregationist. He specifically worked really closely with Sheriff Jim Clark, who was the one who was leading um, the, the deputies and, and men to beat the protesters on Bloody Sunday. After Bloody Sunday, Saul Tepper was convinced that Selma was alone in a struggle against desegregation. 
And he established the Citizens Defense Fund, which was meant to pay bail and fines for white people convicted of crimes against civil rights activists. He said, quote, Selma is fighting almost alone, but Selma is not fighting for itself alone. It is fighting for everything that stands for decency and Western civilization. Saul Tepper said to one of the rabbis who marched to Montgomery, quote, I am Jewish. I am proud of my Jewish heritage. I am not proud that you call yourself a Jew. In fact, I say you are not. I want to be really clear here that not every single member of Temple Mishkan Israel, not every single Southern Jew was an ardent, virulent segregationist in this way. Saul Tepper is certainly an extreme example. But it is important to know that about 20% of Selma's Jews were staunch segregationists. This is really hard data to capture, um, but 20% feels about right based on the anecdotal evidence. Um, but the vast majority of the congregation agreed with Tepper that this sort of external meddling in the affairs of Selma was unacceptable. I don't want to focus too much on the story of this one segregationist Jew, although I do think it's really important to know about him in order to completely understand this story. Saul Tepper is part of this larger pattern in Selma in the white community that's a pattern of white supremacy, white nationalism, and racism. And all of it is tied to commemoration of the Confederacy and celebration of this lost cause, which is something that we've talked about in other parts of the virtual vacation. We are here at the Live Oak Cemetery in Selma, where it is very much on display. I am not interested in giving the lost cause or Confederate commemoration more airtime than it deserves, and to be clear, it deserves zero airtime, but it is an important part of the story of Selma. I'm here at Confederate Memorial Circle in the Live Oak Cemetery in Selma. It is privately owned and maintained by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and several other groups, and it preserves a vision of Selma that is rooted in white supremacy, white nationalism, and virulent racism that is so contrary to the story of Selma that we see when we cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and when we learn about the courageous activism of folks like John Lewis, Dr. King, Hosea Williams, James Bevel. And so I think it's important to understand that this is also a part of the story of Selma and that we can hold these multiple truths about Selma in our minds as we grapple with ongoing legacies of racism and injustice in this country. There is one other key white supremacist name that we really need to know about in Selma, but to learn more about that person, we have to head to another location. So right behind me is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I bet you're wondering, as I was for a long time, who is Edmund Pettus? Edmund Pettus was born in 1821. He died in 1907, and he was the Grand Dragon of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he was also a two-term U.S. Senator and a Confederate General. Um, and legislators here in Alabama named this bridge after him in 1940. Uh, count it, that is long after he was deceased. Um, the bridge is known when it's built as sort of the gateway to Selma, and it's an engineering improvement over the previous bridge. So this is really branding Selma with a vision of the South that's dedicated to white supremacy. Um, the name Edmund Pettus would have been common knowledge for Selma citizens in the 1940s through 1960s. Um, it's fallen out of common knowledge in recent years. Um, but right now, the Edmund Pettus Bridge is synonymous with the civil rights movement um, and the career Outrageous activism of those who crossed it back in 1965. And there's debate now about whether to change the name of the bridge, right? In one sense, it's named after this horrible, horrible uh, KKK leader and Confederate general. Um, but in another sense, the name is now sort of synonymous with the story of Selma. Um, so we're here together in Selma virtually, and we've explored some of the city's Jewish history. We also learned about Selma's links to white supremacy. I want you to have a sense of Selma in the early 1960s as a place where voter suppression was commonplace and where African Americans fought hard against systemic racism and oppression. So let's start our journey through Selma's civil rights history. I'll take you through the years, months, and weeks leading up to the Selma to Montgomery march and give you a sense of the key players in the movement here. Keep in mind that this is a concise overview of this history and there is so much complexity and detail that I just can't include here. Let's get started. Right now, I am outside of the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute. This is an incredible museum that tells the story of the movement in Selma from the 60s to the present. Um, and I really love taking groups here, so I'm sorry that I can't take you inside right now. Um, but because this is usually our first stop on our tours of Selma, I think it's a great place to talk to you about organizing in Selma 
prior to the marches in 1965. So the Dallas County Voters League and the Alabama Voting Rights Project work with SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to register voters here in Selma and in the surrounding areas beginning in 1963. And there's intense resistance to this. In 1963, members of the white population formed the Committee for the Economic Improvement of Colored People, which seeks to move black people out of Dallas County. In 1964, a state circuit judge outlaws marches and meetings of more than three people, which is of course specifically targeting the civil rights movement and civil rights activists. SNCC and these local voting rights groups enlist the help of SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is Dr. King's organization, and this results in high-profile civic and civil rights leaders coming to Selma. So following the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which specifically did not include voter protections, SNCC and the SCLC and other groups ramp up their efforts to fight for voting rights here in Selma and in the surrounding areas. This revitalizes voter registration efforts. And in the year following the passage of the Civil Rights Act, over a thousand demonstrators are arrested here in Selma and in the surrounding areas. All of this is coming to a head in early 1965. On February 18, 1965, there's a civil rights demonstration in Marion, about 30 miles northwest of Selma. And Jimmy Lee Jackson is murdered by a state trooper while trying to shield his family in a cafe. Jackson's death eight days later is the catalyst for the Selma to Montgomery March. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference's Director of Direct Action and Nonviolent Education, James Bevel, gave a sermon at Jackson's funeral in which he quoted the Book of Esther. He said, quote, go unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. So the plan is to march from Selma to Montgomery to petition Governor George Wallace for protections for black voters and registrants and also to confront him about Jimmy Lee Jackson's death. Organizing for these marches and the movement in Selma happens at Brown Chapel AME Church, about 10 blocks from the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It's a hub for organizing, mass meetings, and preparations for the march. The first march is on Sunday, March 7th of 1965. Um, Dr. King is in Washington, D.C. talking to President Johnson about his ideas for civil rights legislation. Um, President Johnson had announced plans for that legislation in March of 65, so Dr. King was in D.C. Um, talking to him about that. Um, and George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, ordered the Alabama Highway Patrol to do whatever was needed to stop the march. So 600 marchers, almost exclusively African American, assembled outside of Brown Chapel AME Church and marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And they're led by John Lewis of SNCC, by Reverend Hosea Williams of SCLC, Bob Mance of SNCC, and Albert Turner of SCLC. Um, they got to the highest point of the bridge and saw a sea of blue. There were state troopers gathered on the other side of the bridge. Um, county Sheriff Jim Clark had asked all of the white men in the county to report to the courthouse that morning to be deputized. Hosea Williams tried to speak to an officer, but troopers immediately advanced with tear gas, nightsticks, and horses. Um, there were 17 marchers who were hospitalized, 50 were treated for lesser injuries, and there's national media attention um, on this moment that becomes known as Bloody Sunday. Um, and there's a statement from President Johnson denouncing the actions of the troopers. I'm in a pavilion at the Little Park on the other side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and I want to talk to you about Turnaround Tuesday. So after Bloody Sunday, there's a call to clergy and citizens from across the United States. 2,500 people descend on Selma. The SCLC tries to gain a court order to protect the marchers, but instead a district judge here in Alabama issued a restraining order that prohibited the march from taking place until the court could hold additional hearings. So there is some disagreement within the SCLC and SNCC and other leadership about whether to proceed. Eventually, Dr. King sort of unilaterally decides that they're going to march to the end of the bridge right here, have a short moment of prayer, and then turn back. There's some confusion as this is happening because the route and the plan had been kept a secret from the vast majority of the marchers. So most of the people who were marching were pretty surprised to see Dr. King stop at the bottom of the bridge and turn around. That evening, there were three white ministers who were on their way back to the SCLC officers and they were beaten in the street by KKK members. Um, Reverend James Reeb of Boston died of his wounds two days later. When Reverend James Reeb was murdered, activists took him to a hospital in Birmingham because the black hospital in Selma didn't have the resources to treat him and the white 
State Hospital wouldn't take him. And he died as a result of his injuries and possibly as a result of delayed medical treatment. There is national mourning for James Reeb, including 25,000 people at a memorial service in Boston. And what I always like to talk about with groups is sort of the difference between the national mourning for Jimmy Lee Jackson and for James Reeb, right? There are 25,000 people at this memorial. It galvanizes people to again understand the importance of the movement in Selma. Um, whereas Jimmy Lee Jackson's murder is, is far less well reported nationally, it's far less known nationally. And this is something that we see time and again, right, in this history, that the media focuses attention on white people who are killed in the fight for civil rights. Um, and the many, many, many black people who suffer incredible violence and who are killed in the struggle for, for civil rights receive far less attention. So now in our timeline, it's the middle of March, and I want to talk to you about activism in Selma following Bloody Sunday and Turnaround Tuesday. So many SNCC members wanted to split from the SCLC because the Turnaround March erased some of Dr. King's credibility in their eyes, and I think that that's a very valid position. I can totally see where they're coming from with that. At the same time that this is happening, there are sit-ins in the White House, confrontations with Governor George Wallace, governor of Alabama, and on March 15th, President Johnson introduces civil rights legislation before Congress, and he praises the courage of activists in Selma on live television. And the bill that he introduces that day becomes the Voting Rights Act. So now I want you to listen to what President Johnson says before Congress on live television on March 15th, 1965. Even if we pass this bill, the battle will not be over. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves 
the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Right around this same time, there's a lawsuit filed that secures federal protection for the marchers. And on March 17th, a federal judge rules in favor of the protesters. They have the First Amendment right to march. And this is in conjunction with a commitment of protection from President Johnson himself. So it is Sunday, March 21st, 1965. 8,000 people assemble at Brown Chapel AME Church. This is a mostly black crowd, but there are also members of the group who are white, Asian American, Latinx. Um, that photograph of those faith leaders um, in Selma, I think is a really great depiction of sort of the diversity of this crowd. And I want you to keep in mind that on Bloody Sunday, on March 7th, there are about 600 marchers. It's a basically an exclusively African American crowd. And now there's a group of 8,000 people from across the country who have come to Selma because of the attention that has been put on this place and because of the incredible organizing efforts of the leaders of the march, right? The world has its eyes focused on Selma on March 21st, 1965. All right, let's walk together virtually across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When we walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it's impossible to forget the thousands of people who have walked this stretch before us. I keep coming back to the word legacy. The legacy of this place is in every step we take on our virtual walk together. In March 2015, civil rights veterans and civic leaders gathered in Selma to mark the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. President Barack Obama addressed the crowd and spoke with reverence about the people who fought for voting rights in this place in 1965. We're going to listen to his words as we make our pilgrimage across the bridge together. There are places and moments in America where this nation's destiny has been decided. Selma is such a place. In one afternoon 50 years ago, so much of our turbulent history, the stain of slavery and anguish of civil war, the yoke of segregation and tyranny of Jim Crow, the death of four little girls in Birmingham, and the dream of a Baptist preacher. All that history met on this bridge. It was not a clash of armies, but a clash of wills, a contest to determine the true meaning of America. And because of men and women like John Lewis, Joseph Lowry, Hosea Williams, Amelia Bunton, Diane Nash, Ralph Abernathy, C.T. Vivian, Andrew Young, Fred Shuttlesworth, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., so many others, the idea of a just America and a fair America, an inclusive America, and a generous America. That idea ultimately triumphed. Now, as is true across the landscape of American history, we cannot examine this moment in isolation. The March on Selma was part of a broader campaign that spanned generations. The leaders that day part of a long line of heroes. We gather here to celebrate them. We gather here to honor the courage of ordinary Americans willing to endure billy clubs and the chastening rod, tear gas and the trampling hoof, men and women who, despite the gush of blood and splintered bone, would stay true to their North Star and keep marching towards justice. They did as Scripture instructed, rejoice in hope, 
Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And in the days to come, they went back again and again. When the trumpet call sounded for more to join, the people came. Black and white, young and old, Christian and Jew, waving the American flag, singing the same anthems full of faith and hope. In time, their chorus would well up and reach President Johnson, and he would send them protection and speak to the nation, echoing their call for America and the world to hear. We shall overcome. What enormous faith these men and women had. Faith in God, but also faith in America. The Americans who crossed this bridge, they were not physically imposing, but they gave courage to millions. They held no elected office, but they led a nation. They marched as Americans who had endured hundreds of years of brutal violence, countless daily indignities, but they didn't seek special treatment, just the equal treatment promised to them almost a century before. What they did here will reverberate through the ages. Not because the change they won was preordained. Not because their victory was complete. But because they proved that nonviolent change is possible. That love and hope can conquer hate. As we commemorate their achievement, we are well served to remember that at the time of the marches, many in power condemned rather than praised them. Back then, they were called communists or half-breeds or outside agitators, sexual and moral degenerates, and worse, they were called everything but the name their parents gave them. Their faith was questioned. Their lives were threatened, their patriotism challenged. And yet, what could be more American than what happened in this place? So normally I do this next part from the bus as we're traveling from Selma to Montgomery. So I guess I'll share it with you in my car. Let's go. The court order that's protecting the marcher states that there can be no more than 300 participants in the march when Highway 80 is a two-lane road. So the march began with 8,000 people. Most of them then returned to Selma by bus or car when it came time to camp that night. The first campsite on March 21st is in the field of David Hall, who's a black farmer. On March 22nd, the marchers camp with Rosie Steele, another black farmer. And a third farmer, Robert Gardner, hosts them on March 23rd. On the 22nd and 23rd, the marchers are camping in muddy fields in the freezing rain. Again, it's mid-March, so it's pretty cold. On March 24th, the marchers crossed into Montgomery County and the road widened. And so additional marchers were ferried by car to join the march. On the night of March 24th, the marchers arrive at their fourth campsite, the city of St. Jude. The city of St. Jude is a 36-acre Black Catholic community, and it lost a lot of sponsors as a result of hosting the marchers. White Catholics who wanted to help Black people supported the city of St. Jude, but they didn't support Dr. King, so a lot of them pulled their donations. Something that I share with every group, even though it's kind of funny to do it in a Jewish context, is that St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless cases and the champion of impossible causes. And I love that imagery, that St. Jude is sort of a symbol of this march, right? That it seems hopeless, it seems impossible, and yet these marchers are filled with hope and they achieve something that for a long time felt impossible. On that last night at the final campsite at the city of St. Jude, there are several thousand people camping out just outside of Montgomery. And there's a rally called Stars for Freedom that's organized by Harry Belafonte, a great friend of the movement, and it features 
popular singers and performers from this time, including Tony Bennett, Nina Simone, Joan Baez, and so many more. On Thursday, March 25th, 1965, 25,000 people marched from the final campsite to the state capitol building in Montgomery to hear Dr. King and others speak. And they waited outside of the building until one of Governor Wallace's secretaries came out and took their petition. They never met directly with Governor Wallace. That wasn't going to happen. Dr. King gives one of his most famous speeches called Our God is Marching On on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol. And I want you to listen to a little snippet of it right now. Last Sunday, more than 8,000 of us started on a mighty walk from Selma, Alabama. We have walked through desolate valleys and across the trying hills. We have walked on meandering highways and rested our bodies on rocky byways. Some of our faces are burned from the outpourings of the sweltering sun. Some have literally slept in the mud. We have been drenched by the rain. Our bodies are tired. Our feet are somewhat sore. Today I want to tell the city of Selma, tell them not to. Today I want to say to the state of Alabama, yes sir. Today I want to say to the people of America and the nations of the world that we are not about to turn around. Yes sir. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, we are on the move and no wave of racism can stop us. Yes, sir. We are on the move now. Mm -hmm. The burning of our churches will not deter us. Yes, sir. The bombing of our homes will not dissuade us. Did you hear yes, sir. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. The feeding and killing of our clergymen and young people will not divert us. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The webs and release of their known murderers would not discourage us. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like an idea whose time has come. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not even the marching of mighty armies can hold us. Yes, sir. We are moving to the land of freedom. Yes, sir. The battle is in our hands. We can answer with creative nonviolence. A call to higher ground to which the new directions of our struggle summons us. Yes, the road ahead is not altogether a smooth one. Mm -hmm. There are no broad highways that lead us easily and inevitably to quick solutions. Mm -hmm. We must keep going. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men, darken their understanding and drive bright out wisdom from a sacred throne. Somebody's asking when will wounded justice lie prostrate on the streets of Selma, Birmingham, and communities all over the South, be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. Somebody's asking, when will the radiant star of hope be plunged against the nocturnal bosom of this lonely night, plucked from weary souls the chains of fear and the manacles of death? How long will justice be crucified and truth buried? Yes, sir. I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long. Because truth crushed to earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long? Not long. Yes, sir. Because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long? Not long. Yes, sir. Because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long? Yes, sir. Not long. How long? Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future 
Yes. Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? No. Not long. No. Because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, He's trampling out the village oh, where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yes. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, yes, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, yes, hallelujah. Yes, His truth is marching on. Later that night, Klan members murder Viola Liuzzo. She is a white woman from Detroit who was inspired by calls to action after Bloody Sunday and came to Selma to support the march. She was ferrying marchers home in her car. As we tell this story, it's really important to say the names of and remember Viola Liuzzo, Reverend James Reeb, and Jimmy Lee Jackson, who are the folks who lose their lives in the fight for voting rights in Selma in 1965. So we are nearing the end of our virtual march. Progress after the march in 1965 was pretty slow. In 1960, there were a total of 53,336 black voters registered in the state of Alabama. Three decades later, there were 537,285, a tenfold increase. The Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail was designated in 1996. But the struggle isn't over. Right now, in 2020, 42% of Selma's residents live in poverty. Just on a personal note, this is my first time being back in Selma since we lost Congressman John Lewis. He is a titan in the history of this moment. And it's really poignant always to be here, but especially now that he's no longer with us. And so I wanted to end with his words about Selma. John Lewis said, Selma is more than the name of a city. It's more than a place. It's the realization of an idea. Thank you all so much for joining me for this session. I absolutely love uh, talking to folks about Selma and this virtual version of that is no exception. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation about the history of Selma, um, please, please, please feel free to put them in the Facebook comments. Um, and I will, I will try to answer as many of those as I can. I'm just refreshing that now. Um, in the meantime, I would like to do a little momentary acknowledgement. So let me go ahead and share my screen once more. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that today is the 103rd birthday of Fannie Lou Hamer. She is a Mississippi civil rights activist who was an organizer and a role model in the movement here. And she faced incredible odds in her numerous attempts to register to vote, which galvanized her in her work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, whose work we learned about um, in our session about Selma. She used her powerful singing voice and her skills as an orator to fight for representation in the Democratic Party. She was a co-founder and leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and she advocated for racial and economic justice for residents of the Mississippi Delta. And one of her rallying cries uh, has become a touchstone that I, I'd love to share with all of you. Nobody's free until everybody's free. We're going to learn more about her in a couple of weeks on the virtual vacation during a session about the civil rights movement in Mississippi that, that I'm really looking forward to. Um, again, if you have any questions about this pre presentation, please feel free to share them. Um, we're continuing this essential conversation about civil rights next week with a session that we are calling The Movement Continues. We're gonna hear from people who are currently doing work to advance civil rights and voting rights in the United States, including some friends of the ISJL at Carolina Jews for Justice and the Southern Poverty Law Center. And you uh, definitely don't wanna miss it. So please join us next week 
on Tuesday, October 13th at 11 a.m. Central Time. And you can learn more and sign up for updates about the ISGL virtual vacation on our website, which is isgl.org forward slash virtual vacation. So thank you so much again for joining us for this virtual trip through Selma. Um, I hope that, ins that it inspires you and, and galvanizes you as we, as we move forward. Um, and I hope that um, you're able to visit Selma safely at some point in the future to go to all of these places in person. Um, so thank you again all so much for joining us. Um, and we will see you next week, same time, same place, to learn more about how the civil rights movement has continued into the present. Thank you all so much.